All right, welcome back to Cultish, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I'm one of the co-hosts here. I am joined by Andrew, the super sleuth of the show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well, and I'm in my new new super secret hideout, man. It's very yes, nice. A brand new super secret hideout. Well, yep. I am super excited to actually see that in person, but I'm even more super excited because we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Brown. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, I am doing great. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. Okay, when I first started doing my radio broadcast before we did a video stream many years back, uh, we were broadcasting from the basement office I had in the building where we were. Oh, so wow. I just thought I found out it was a former bomb shelter. So I would start my broadcast, you know, coming from a hidden location in a former bomb shelter. One day I flip on Mark Levin, of course, who's yeah. big and famous nationally. Mm -hmm. And that was basically how we started the show. And I thought, no one's going to think that I didn't copy it from him, <laughs> but uh, I had never heard it until then. So I don't, I don't think that Andrew was copying from me and I no. didn't copy from Mark. So just want to set the record straight there, but oh, yeah. it's a joy to be with you guys. Well, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic today, really talking about counter missionaries. And to, from my understanding, these are uh, people in the Jewish community, uh, specifically rabbis, and their focus is to try and reach out to those who are Messianic Jews who believe that Jesus, Yeshua is the Messiah, and they're trying to uh, reconvert them back to their version of Judaism. Is that is that really what that is all about? Uh, yes, yes. So in, in, in their view, we are all missionaries. So as Jewish believers in Jesus, we are missionaries. They're familiar with Christian missionaries. And when you understand the history of anti-Semitism in the church— when you understand that traditional Jews in particular see Jesus and Christianity through the lens of Crusades, Inquisition, even Holocaust, but to them, it's an absolute betrayal of Jewish history, Jewish community, Jewish covenant for a Jew to become a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I remember being at a big Messianic rally in Israel, big conference, and there were religious Jews protesting outside of the hotel and some of them were saying, Hitler wanted our bodies, you want our souls. Wow. So that would make someone like me, that God's raised up to be on the front lines of Jewish outreach and apologetics, kind of a public enemy, number one. But it was very common when I came to faith 50 years ago, when so many Jews were coming to faith during the Jesus People movement, late 60s, early 70s. It was very common that the moment you come to faith, then your parents want you to talk to the rabbi. Mm -hmm. Go talk to the local rabbi. Even though the local rabbi didn't specialize in this, your average rabbi is, is, is well-educated, the more religious, the more so in terms of educated in the scriptures and tradition. And therefore, they would be ready to say, look, you're quoting this verse about a messianic prophecy. It doesn't mean that it's mistranslated. New Testament's twisting things. Mm -hmm. And many of these people who came to faith, we can debate whether they were true believers or not, but this much is sure. They outwardly professed faith in Jesus and, and then left the faith, denied the faith. And then there were certain books written that were specific books countering Christian claims uh, about Jesus being the Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, then groups like Jews for Judaism rose up. Uh, yes, they were concerned if a Jew became a Buddhist, if a Jew was a Hindu, but the greatest numbers were becoming followers of Jesus and then over the years, some have specialized in this. It's kind of their life work. And one in particular with a big internet presence shifted his focus and began attacking Gentile Christians. And, and instead of saying, hey, it's fine for a Gentile Christian, but this is wrong for a Jew. So he has destroyed the faith of many Christians in the process. And we have been working against this for decades, putting out all kinds of material, doing debates to counter the counter missionaries. Mm. Wow. So what's the counter missionary that goes after the Gentile Christian? What what do they want for the Gentile Christian just to lose their faith in Christ and not go anywhere? Uh, well, not to not go anywhere. So the most prominent one is Rabbi Tovia Singer. If folks go to our Jewish website, we have a specific Jewish outreach website, realmessiah.com, realmessiah.com. So they'll get answers to the top hundred Jewish objections You'll see debates have done with rabbis, but then a new series we started putting out. The first 11 or 12 videos are out where I specifically take Rabbi Singer's material and point by point debunk it and demolish the error in it because it's become more widespread. So 
in his view, everyone needs to repent and turn to the God of Israel. And Christians are idol worshipers because of the Trinity and the deity of Jesus. And therefore, they need to repent and turn to the God of Israel and not become traditional Jews, not convert to Judaism, but rather follow basic moral and spiritual principles that Judaism mm -hmm. calls the seven laws of Noah. Uh, don't worship idols, don't blaspheme, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, establish courts of justice, don't eat the limb of a living animal that they, by rabbinic homiletical interpretation, deduced from Genesis 2 and Genesis 9. So he would say, follow the seven laws of Noah, that's all a Gentile needs to do, but repent of Christianity. Over the centuries, the rabbis would more have said, you stay in your lane, we stay in our lane. Judaism mm -hmm. is for the Jews, and we don't agree with Christianity, but you you do as, as you do. But he's become kind of aggressive with anti-Christian outreach. Wow. Wow. Now, you now you mentioned, I appreciate you sharing that, uh, Dr. Brown. Now, you mentioned you have your own website, and also roughly 50 years ago, you said that you came to faith. Would you be able to, for any of our audience who, who, who are not familiar with you, uh, could you just tell them just a little about who you are, uh, yeah. specifically your upbringing, just a little bit of how you came to faith, but also, I mean, I'm kind of looking at a little bit of your biography here. I'll let you share what you'd like to share, but yeah, tell them a little bit, a little bit about that and also what makes you somewhat of an expert on the subject at hand regarding uh, counter missionaries, anti-Semitism, all those things that you mentioned. Yes. So I came to faith in 1971, I was born in 55 raised in a conservative Jewish home on Long Island, born in New York City, raised in Long Island. But your viewers need to know that conservative does not mean conservative morally, politically. It's conservative Judaism, which is pretty liberal, pretty wishy-washy in terms of compared to the rigor of traditional Judaism, but still conserving certain Jewish traditions. So I was bar mitzvahed at the age of 13 in 1968, but the, the spirituality was so shallow for me that I learned to, to chant a portion of the Hebrew Bible at my bar mitzvah, but no one ever sat me down and said, now let's look at the English and study this to see what you're reading. It was just learning to chant the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, look at it like a Christian who was baptized at birth, uh, went to communion, and then would show up for Christmas and Easter and, and weddings. Mm -hmm. That was my Judaism. Mm -hmm. So it was very superficial. And the big spiritual event for me at 13 was seeing Jimi Hendrix in concert oh. because I was into rock music. Uh, Beatles came to America in 64. So 69, uh, I was offered pot. I thought, yeah, let me try it. I mean, we're not supposed to, and the rock stars yeah. do it. And then I had a high tolerance to drugs. So when I didn't get high from pot or hash, very quickly, I started doing harder drugs. I was shooting heroin by the time I was 15. I was known as drug bear and iron man because I could put massive quantities of drugs in my body. I, I once did enough hallucinogenics for 30 people and ended up in the hospital for the night. Next day, I thought, look at how cool I am. So I was, I was really a very lost person. Mm -hmm. And my two best friends were going to a little gospel church. We were playing in a band together. They were getting high with me, but they liked two girls whose uncle was a Pentecostal pastor. Uh, the girls started going to the church. They started going. I went to pull them out. And God began to convict me of my own sin. The people there were praying for me. I didn't know they were praying. God began to convict me. The things I was boasting about one day, I felt miserable about the next day. And November 12th of 71, I went back to a service. After about three, four months, I went back. And for the first time, I believed Jesus died for my sins. But I, I didn't want to repent. I, I loved my sin. I wanted to be a drug-using rock star. But I, I knew it was wrong now. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So I had a battle for five weeks. And finally, December 17th of 71, I, I uh, had an overwhelming encounter with the joy of the Lord, singing these little ditty hymns with a piano player, as compared to going to a Led Zeppelin concert or a Hendrix concert where the volume is so loud, your ears are bursting. Here's a pastor's wife playing piano and we're singing when we all get to heaven or blessed assurance or, yeah. you know, some Isaac Watts hymn. And I get overwhelmed with joy and realize this is different than anything I ever experienced. It's of a different quality. This must be what they call the joy of the Lord. And right then I got a clear revelation of the love of God in my mind's eye. I saw myself covered with dirt and mud from head to toe, washed clean with the blood of Jesus 
beautiful white robes put on me and I was going back out and playing in the mud. And I said to God, I will never put a needle in my arm again. I was free from that moment on. And when my dad saw the change in my life, he said, Michael, I'm glad you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. So he brought me to meet the local rabbi who befriended me and right out of the gate gave me a book on anti-Semitism in church history, which was a shocker. Yeah. I mean, who knew? But because I was saved in a Pentecostal church, which is kind of, we go straight back to the Bible. Uh, I wasn't really concerned with what Lutherans did or Catholics did or other groups did mm -hmm. because I just, I skipped church history. Now you can't do that, but that's right. what I did early on. But then he kept challenging me. You don't know Hebrew. How can you tell us what to believe? So even though I, I, I spent six or seven hours alone with God in the word and prayer every day, once, once I was in the Lord for about a year, I used to memorize 20 verses a day, read through the Bible cover to cover probably five times in the first two years, but I didn't know Hebrew. And when I met with the, this rabbi, kept bringing me to meet other rabbis, very religious, very devout, very kind men, prayed for hours every day. They seemed to want to please God with every fiber of their being. And they looked much more authentically Jewish than me. And, and I can't read Hebrew. So I knew, okay, I know the Lord has changed my life. I know that's real, but I don't have answers for a lot of their questions. So I've got to get, I've got to dig. I've got to follow the truth. So that long story led to me getting a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures from New York University. But as I was challenged over the years, I went to Jews for Jesus and they were great at evangelism, but they didn't emphasize apologetics back then. I, I went to Christian scholars. They were brilliant, but they had no sensitivity to Jewish objections. So basically I, there was no one out there. There was no literature out there. And, and when I started debating rabbis, I felt I've, I've got to provide answers and little by little compiled material. So I wrote the five volume work uh, answering Jewish objections to Jesus, most of it published by Baker. They came mm -hmm. out from 2000 to 2010. It was really the, the only thing of its kind that's been done since then. Thankfully, others keep using it, building on it. I believe I've debated, had more public debates with rabbis than any human being on the planet today. It's just something that rabbis are not only eager to do, but God's opened the door for that. We've seen great fruit come from these things. We have a 22-hour series on countering the counter missionaries. And, and for years, I would be introduced in a Jewish setting of outreach, whatever, as the mm. world's foremost Messianic Jewish apologist. And I would say, yeah, number one among one. I said, it's like <laughs> playing center on the pygmy basketball team. Right. You don't have to be that tall to do it, you know, um, because there just was not a lot. Thankfully, right. much more has come and more scholarship and so many others with a good message and doing good outreach and even having debate. But that's part of what we do. Uh, I have a great passion to see the church renewed, coming to its first love, so true historic revival in the church. Mm. I have a great burden. I'm involved in the culture wars, so I long to see a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution where the effect of the gospel on us is such that we are changed to the point of changing those around us. So the three R's of our ministry, revival in the church, gospel-based moral and cultural revolution in society, redemption in Israel. And our main site is AskDrBrown.org. We do a daily live radio show finished up right before coming to record with you called mm -hmm. the line of fire yeah where we serve as your voice for moral <laughs> sanity and spiritual clarity so that's 50 plus years in a few minutes sorry to take so much time no it's 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 really really good. good that's that's a great summary uh so just uh andrew i think you had a question because i think andrew you want to jump to the next point about uh the polarization yeah, I have a couple of questions. Before I get to that one, I just want to ask real quick, because you said when you first came uh, to Christ, the rabbi handed you a book on uh, the, the history of uh, anti-Semitism. Like, what is what is the the point to the to be the draw of that? Like, what is the apologetic behind that handing someone who just comes to Christ, who's uh, a Jew, a book on anti-Semitism? It's supposed to be like an emotional pull back into Judaism. Let's just say Judaism. if there's anyone who cannot possibly be the Messiah, it's Jesus. If there's anyone who is disqualified by the bad fruit from the bad tree, it's Jesus. If there's any religion which cannot possibly be God's religion on the planet, it's Christianity. Because if it's hatred of Jews, demonizing of Jews, mistreatment of Jews, persecution of Jews, banishing of Jews, killing of Jews, offering them baptism or death, etc., with culminating with Adolf Hitler, relying on the writings of Martin Luther and, and reprinting them in the writings of John Chrysostom as seven sermons against the Jews, that that's, that's the apologetic. And because gotcha. it's so pervasive 
in both Catholic and Protestant church history, uh, whereas the philo-Semitism or a, a more biblical view is, is much less prominent. It's important. Look, I grew up in a day where evangelical Christians are great friends of Israel, and, and the Jewish community recognizes that some of their best friends in the world are conservative Christians, but it hasn't always been like that. Gotcha. That, make, that makes sense. So when you think of when they think of Jesus, they instantly think of anti-Semitism in, in a sense. Um, here's here's one of the questions we were thinking of. So, you know, COVID-19, everything got nuts in 2019, 2020. We've got the Biden administration right now. We know uh, outreach looks different. Evangelism looks uh, different. So what what is it going on? in the world, how does, how does it look right now with these counter-missionary efforts? Uh, what are things looking like even going into uh, Israel with people going to do evangelism there? Like, what's, what's happening now? So uh, counter-missionaries have done most of their work via uh, internet or via written material or via one-on-one -on -one counseling over the years. It's, it's never been that, uh, and there, there, there have been small groups of, of them, small organizations Right, so they say the funding behind a Jews for Jesus is massively, massively bigger than than the funding behind counter missionary organizations. So, when internet comes up, they've used that a lot more now, effectively with video. But otherwise, it was written material. It might be a seminar, and what they would do is they would educate other rabbis. So now the rabbis had the material to go to. Uh, so it hasn't really changed in that regard. It's it's not like you're going to have a mass gospel crusade, of course, crusade being a dirty word here in, in, yeah. in Jewish circles, but it's not like you're going to have that in thousands with an altar call. It's going to be more the rabbi sitting with someone one-on-one -on -one or saying, hey, read this book. You hear Brown said this, here's somebody who refutes Brown, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So it hasn't really shifted in that regard. As opposed to Christians going to do evangelism in Israel, uh, God can use that for sure, like anywhere. But there's a joke that if you start a Bible study in Jerusalem, you'll get nine missionaries and one Jew. Mm. Uh, Jerusalem has more missionaries per capita than any other place on the planet. Wow. And uh, yeah, and people go on a tour, you know, we'll lead a tour to Israel and, and our folks know better, but others they'll go, oh, I'm going on a tour to Israel. I'm going to win all these Israelis. <laughs> like, you think you're just going to show up wearing a t-shirt right. and there's something going to get saved. So most of the effective evangelism that goes on in Israel is Jewish believers in the land and, and Christians who love the Jewish people in the land living there, mm. sharing the gospel with friends, neighbors, just like everywhere else. Right. That it's, it's, it's more done in that way. And that's continued the same. So COVID hasn't affected any of that. The dynamic uh, within Israel is a little different. The dynamic in Israel is that, uh, okay, you, you, you have governments that are very fragile in Israel because they're coalition governments. Right. So you have 120 seats in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, and you don't vote for a person, you vote for a party. You can have as many as 22 different parties, all with candidates vying for uh, for spots in the Knesset for seats. You have to get a threshold of, of enough votes for four seats. So you may have 13 different parties actually get seats. So nobody has a majority. Yeah. So let's say Netanyahu's party, Likud, wins. Let's say they get 38 seats. Well, they still have to get 23 others to agree with them, 23 other seats to get to 61. So uh, in the past, Netanyahu has had to rely on Orthodox Jewish groups, ultra-Orthodox groups. Maybe this one has six seats, this one has eight, but hey, without them, you're not forming your coalition, right? Mm -hmm. When that happens, when these ultra-Orthodox groups have more power, they will allow for more opposition to Messianic Jews. It, it can be more difficult to emigrate into the land. There may be more pressure against Messianic Jews in the land, even trying to get some of them out. So it's always a delicate thing. You might like Netanyahu's policies, but then yeah. you don't like the coalition with religious Jews. Here and there, there is overt outward persecution of, of Jewish believers in the land from ultra-Orthodox Jews. And sometimes the government isn't as quick as it needs to be to stand with the believers. But overall, people can worship freely there. There were several hundred smaller Messianic congregations within Israel. Uh, people know where they are, who they are. The vast majority go about their business free of, of hassle. Uh, and 
of course, Christians in the land can worship freely. So there is opposition. It can come in different ways, but it's not just an overt thing where you can't, you could share the gospel in the streets. You could, you could get up on the street corner and preach. Mm -hmm. If you did it in an ultra Orthodox area, that might be the last thing you ever did. But if you did anywhere else, you, you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. and that won't be stopped. No, no, I, I appreciate that. Some great insight, Dr. Brown. So question, maybe this would be good for our audience in just in regards to defining terms. Could you explain just a little bit the difference between the branches of Judaism? So you have Reformed, Conservative, and Orthodox branches of Judaism. So yeah. within those categories, maybe define those a little bit. And also, in which categories do you see uh, people who are Jewish in those branches of Judaism coming to know Jesus? And in which branch would you say is the most activity when it comes to counter-missionaries? What are your thoughts on that? Right. Yeah, great questions. Uh, uh, all the questions have been great so far. So— through Jewish history, uh, once you get past the New Testament period and destruction of the temple, so Pharisaic Judaism then arises as the Judaism that makes it. The other ancient groups, Essenes, Sadducees, and others basically fade, fade away. And Pharisaical Judaism, which becomes Rabbinic Judaism, becomes the Judaism. So you could be a secular Jew, right? Maybe you're an atheist. Mm -hmm. But if you were a practicing Jew, that was the Judaism uh, through, through the centuries. Uh, then in the 18th century in Germany, as Jews are now coming out of ghettos more, as there is more societal tolerance and they don't have to, to live in, a, in as cloistered or closed way, the educated Jews are now beginning educated in a more secular way and becoming more, quote, enlightened. And with that, they begin to cast off much of the tradition that speaks of Israel as a chosen nation, the Jewish people as a chosen people, the mm -hmm. restrictive dietary laws, the, the emphasis on, on learning the traditions, Talmud and all of that. So they were now going to reform Judaism. So reform Judaism is not reformed as in Calvinist, but reform. Mm -hmm. So reform Judaism uh, is, is still the largest branch of Judaism in America today. But when it rose up and in, in, in through the 1800s, by the time of the Holocaust, there were traditional rabbis saying in Germany, this is a judgment on the Jewish people because of Reform Judaism. And it was, it, in the traditional eyes, it was looked at as utter apostasy. Mm -hmm. In America today, Reform Jews were the first to ordain female rabbis, but take it 100 times further, they were the first to ordain gay and lesbian rabbis. A reformed Jews would be champions of the major causes on the left that we as followers of Jesus normally strongly differ with. Mm. Uh, reformed Jews will call their, their gathering places temples, whereas traditional Jews say there's the temple in Jerusalem. We meet in synagogues. Uh, they'll have music in their services. The, the, if you think of just liberal religion, that would be reformed Judaism. A little over 100 years ago, conservative Judaism rose up in the middle of these two, between reform and traditional Judaism. They wanted to conserve the traditions. They wanted Jewish people to continue to, to have more attachment to their history because Judaism is very much a corporate religion and very much a historic religion. Do this to remember. Learn from your fathers and pass it on to your sons. So they wanted to do that, but intellectually, they had more liberal views of scripture and Jewish tradition. For example, they didn't believe that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. They believed that there were two or three Isaiahs. They, they, they had intellectually more liberal views, but religiously were more conservative. So that grew up in terms of lifestyle closer to traditional Jews, in terms of beliefs on, on biblical authority, things like that maybe closer to reform. And, and that was a large part of Judaism uh, for for a good part of the 20th century. But then what's happened is conservative has gone further and further to the left and has less and less adherence. It's kind of like if, if you're going to be in, be in. If you're going to be out, be out. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't had holding ground as much. Reform Judaism continues to lose members because traditional Jews would say, if you're not a traditional Jew within three or four generations, all Jewish identity will be lost. You will be right. completely assimilated, which is what normally happens. And uh, that's why many Jewish believers in Jesus feel it's important to maintain a Jewish identity simply for solidarity through the generations. In any case, 
Reform Judaism welcomes intermarriage. So if you're going to convert to Judaism, that's the easy way to do it. There's not a lot of demands <laughs> yeah. that are put on you. So there's growth through that. And it's a kind of a holding ground for more liberal minded Jews. But but assimilation takes a massive toll on American Jews and Jews in other parts of the world outside of Israel every year. All right. So Orthodox, they would be the ones who have the, the longest history of adhering to the traditions of observing the Sabbath, the dietary laws of of men praying three times daily of the great devotion mm-hmm. within Orthodox Judaism. So you have reform, conservative and Orthodox, and you have even further to the left of reform, reconstructionist Judaism or humanist Judaism, but those, those are much smaller, right? So reform, conservative, Orthodox. Among the Orthodox, you have left and right wings. Left wing Orthodox would be Ben Shapiro. That's called modern Orthodox, right? Yeah. Jared Kushner, not, not as observant as Ben, but you know, doesn't have the Omicron all the time. He would be modern Orthodox, right? So absolutely believe in observing the Sabbath, absolutely believe in the authority of traditions, raise your children with a strong Jewish identity, but not to the extreme of ultra-Orthodox. Yeah. Hey, ultra-Orthodox the- are the fastest growing. Yeah. Uh, one of my friends who's a counter-missionary ultra-Orthodox rabbi has 14 kids, and in his community, it's totally normal. Um, that, that would make up ultra-Orthodox Jews maybe as many as 15% mm. of the population of Israel today. Yeah. Orthodox Jews in America overall all groups would, would be 10% roughly of the Jewish community of America. In Israel, ultra-Orthodox, 15% Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox, maybe as high as 30%. So they would even more stringently live by the traditions. And then you have among them different branches, Hasidic Jews, non-Hasidic Jews. Um, and most counter-missionary rabbis have been Orthodox or ultra Orthodox, because they're the ones most committed to the cause. Here and there, I've interacted with reform and conservative counter missionaries, but that's been rare. The ones I interact with and have some for over 20 years, sometimes daily, are, are ultra Orthodox. Mm. Yeah, and was something just an interesting observation as well, too, because you're giving, and I appreciate just giving us that broad overview, is that even from within the Jewish community, there's a different Point, varying point as far as even political views go. So you have Ben, you have Ben Shapiro, for example, who who's a head of the day, who's on the Daily Wire, who's politically conservative. But then you have someone like Bill Maher, who's definitely to the left, who is also Jewish. And then you even have someone like Steven Spielberg, who directed Schindler's List. He is very well known. He's very open in his Jewish heritage, but he's but politically he definitely stands to the left. So in regards to just maybe just real quickly how they view the world politically, is there any sort of connection between like what's the Jewish worldview typically when it comes to just understanding things politically, just out of curiosity? Right. So secular Jews would be very much like left wing liberal Christians. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's for a couple of reasons. One is historically, uh, the idea of a Christian nation has been very bad for Jews, mm-hmm. and it, it it means that they get excluded and sometimes even persecuted, and in some cases, expelled. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, when Jews learn history, 1492 is not when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 1492 is when all non-baptized Jews were expelled from Spain. Oh. So. The idea of of a Christian nation, the idea of the Republican Party being the strong Christian party or Christian nationalism, that's all scary language to Jewish people. They just think of dominance where where they are excluded. So there's often been a reaction against the religious right or conservative Christian religion. And then along with that, there is a prophetic sense, but detached from the heart of God, meaning we are standing up for the underprivileged. We are standing up. It's part of our Jewish tradition and heritage to stand up for the underdog, to stand up for the outcast, to stand up for those society rejects. Well, who are those? Gays and lesbians, women wanting to have an abortion. They are the ones they must stand with. So they stand for same-sex marriage. They stand for abortion. And for some of them, it's, it's a religious thing. It's, it's a right thing for them to do as religious people. Uh, again, Spielberg and, and Mara would be secular Jews 
in that regard. They're obviously not religious Jews. Mm -hmm. For a Ben Shapiro, uh, obviously a lot of things are ideologically, he, he's brilliant. All these guys, of course, are very sharp, uh, but but he's he's coming at this from a Jewish perspective, also from a larger perspective of the dangers of the left. But the more religious you are, uh, the more likely you are to have conservative moral values, the more likely you are to oppose homosexual activism. I've had uh, rabbis talk to me about the importance of the work that I'm doing in pushing back against LGBTQ activism. Mm. Uh, there are ultra-Orthodox rabbis, even though there's some differences with abortion, who work together with pro-life groups and things like that. Ultra-Orthodox Jews are increasingly voting Republican. Um, um, the most religious Jews in America, uh, many of them voted for Trump. So it's, it's mm -hmm. interesting. They have these different values. What's really curious, though, is your average evangelical Christian uh, is more concerned about the well-being of Israel and standing with Israel than your average American Jew. Your average American Jew uh, opposes anti-Semitism and does care about the well-being of, of Israel. But if, if you're yeah. a really left wing, you're always you know, talking about the rights of the Palestinians and the needs of the Palestinians, uh, along with your, your people, Israel. Uh, and you're not looking at it as prophetic fulfillment as much as many evangelical Christians are. Mm. Uh, but you know, one other thing, in terms of which Jews are most likely to come to faith, it's, it's the same as you get with any religion. The more devoted a person is to their religion, yeah. right? If you're an absolute devoted Muslim and you're in 10 generations of devoted Muslims, or you are a very, very traditional Italian Catholic, it's going to be harder for you to, to have a born again, new life experience in Jesus than someone who's nominal. So it's the same with the same with Jews. The more traditional you are, the more entrenched you are, the more educated you are in that, the less likely you are to believe. And ones that we've seen come to faith from ultra orthodox circles, sometimes it's been years and years and years. Uh, I, I mean, over 20 years before we've seen the fruit. Uh, and then those that are more secular, like me, you know, doing drugs and partying and getting saved, that's, that's the way it happens, I think, in, in all religions. It, it makes yeah. sense that the more devoted you are, the harder it is to come out. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. Andrew, what are, you, what, are, what are your thoughts, sir? Do you have what, – what are yeah. some questions that you have with, with what Dr. Brown was saying? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to me how I'd say like progressive Christians are very similar in a sense uh, politically and liberally to yeah. what it seems like far left leaning – uh, Jews, because I mean, we both, both in both terms, you're departing from the same standard in terms of the law of God. So you're swinging yeah. in one specific direction from a base of morals, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's very extreme. It's actually extremely interesting to me just to hear that. I think that's very well explained. So, uh, Dr. Michael Brown, so what are like the success rates for these, uh, counter missionaries? Uh, is there, do you have like a percentages on that or anything like that? Do you know specific ones or? Yeah, so, so I've, I've interacted with counter-missionary rabbis for many years. Some have become personal friends. In other words, if, if I said, hey, I'm telling you something in confidence, they'll keep it in confidence. I, I believe them. Some cases I've met some of their families. <clears throat> rabbi Shmuley Boteach, known as America's most famous rabbi, uh, he and I have done over 20 debates. I think it's the number now. And I've spent time with his family. We're, we're very close. But he's not primarily a counter-missionary rabbi. He's, he's kind of a celebrity rabbi, just by which I mean a well-known guy that, you know, that, that, that speaks and knows a lot of major leaders. Um, but there, there's no possible way to know statistics uh, any more than I can tell you the success rate of us doing Jewish outreach. What I can say is by God's grace, more Jews are coming to faith than are being pulled away, that the number of Jewish believers on the planet continues to grow and, and that's wonderfully encouraging to see what God is doing. Uh, that being said, the losses have definitely been significant in that we, we, for years, would get families calling us and saying, what do we do? So-and-so is following you know, a brother or sister or family member, something like that. Uh, I can say that I've known Jewish believers now for decades and uh, if, if I had to think, people that I've known well that, that were solid believers, can I think of any of them who fell away and became traditional Jews? I'd have to draw my brain, draw my mind, maybe a, a, a few, maybe. But there are definitely many who are not as well grounded. 
that do fall away. Uh, it, it is, it was especially common it, it, when so many were coming to faith in the Jesus people movement, late sixties, early seventies, it was so many, and there was very little discipling in a lot of the churches. So people didn't really get grounded and, and, and it was easier for them to be picked off. And then we didn't have the material to give them. Mm, yeah. But like I've run into people, uh, I was speaking, I forget where it was. I think it was Dallas, but a guy came up to me, a Jewish believer and said, I'm in the faith because of you. What he meant was he had come to faith but then got hit with objections and was wavering until he read my answering Jewish objections books mm-hmm. or watched a debate. So we've heard that for years and years, but without question, counter missionaries would be effective. Some of them would say that they've pulled hundreds and hundreds of people away from Jesus. I, I heard a counter missionary seminar once that someone had attended, given me the tapes privately. And the counter missionary rabbi said that he had pulled over a hundred Jews away from Jesus or brought them back to tradition, but only one of them was living as a traditional Jew. He said, hmm. so they went from being Jews for Jesus to Jews for nothing, which I found very, very interesting. Uh, but success rate, I can, I, I can say that since we started doing specific refutations of Rabbi Singer, we debated in the early nineties and he's refused to deal with me since then. But since we started doing these, Oh, on a very regular basis, we hear from Christians saying, man, my faith was getting shaken and this is just what I needed uh, to help. So for if you think of it, Jewish apologetics, right? You can go to seminaries across America and very, very few are going to have any classes on this. It's, it's just somehow forgotten. As mm. fundamental as it is, the salvation of Israel being so important in mm. scripture that Jewish apologetics are just kind of forgotten. I was recently part of this annual uh, apologetics tournament online. Mm-hmm. Just a fun thing. You vote yeah. for your favorite apologists. <laughs> but the fun thing is you get to know each other. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. In fact, Jeff Durbin only beat me like a year or two ago with the help of, of James White. James turned oh. on me. Oh, no. Work closely with Jeff. <laughs> okay. But that was fine. I, I didn't. <laughs> I then worked with James's opponent to, to be James, <laughs> but that's, that was just some, but it's all in good fun. Mm-hmm, but, for sure. And, and that's, we get to meet a lot of people. People I didn't know who they were, get to meet them. But mm-hmm. when I was looking at it, it's like, wait a second. I don't, how many does it start with? 256 or 128? Am I the only one involved in Jewish apologetics that's on here? Yeah. That that's, that's striking. Mm-hmm. It, and, but because now more Christians are being affected and then the Muslims are taking the material of, of Toby Singh and others and using that to attack Christians. So now, now I'm hearing from Christians doing Islamic apologetics who are using my materials to answer the Muslims because the Muslims are using the materials of the counter missionary rabbis. How's Interesting. That? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, real quickly. Are you familiar, Dr. Brown with a book uh, betrayed by Stan Telchin? Of course. Yeah. So I remember reading that book. I was in community college and I had a classmate in my world religions class who was Jewish. And so I just wanted to get an understanding of, okay, what what could I actually bring up to her? And yeah. in that, I think I saw a lot of what you were just talking about, just the cultural complexities. They very, There's a very high view of family. There's a great deal of uh, patriarchal respect uh, within whatever branch of Judaism that you're in that you see a, a whole lot for sure. But not only that, we're going to talk in just a moment about some of the top objections that people bring up, but it's not just, there's a deeper level to it from my understanding. Maybe you can give me your thoughts on this, Dr. Brown, is that it's not just about giving answers to objections. This is about all of a sudden someone is, they get changed. They have an encounter with Jesus as they experience Yeshua as the Messiah. And all of a sudden they're in conflict. How do I deal with believing in this and having this joy and this understanding versus understanding and respecting my father, uh, my parents, or my family, but also I'm assuming within the within Judaism, there's also a very deal of high patriarchal respect to rabbis. They're looked very highly to. So mm-hmm. maybe explain. And you've you've had a lot of time. I mean, you've got decades of experience dealing with Jews who have been in this situation. Maybe bring us in into the mindset of how does someone who is Jewish like what's the conflict b- between getting those answers, but also handling the yeah. sociological pressures of looking up to your family and also to those who are rabbis. So if I remember in Betrayed, when Stan Telchin's daughter, I think it was, told him that she believed in Jesus. Yeah. 
he heard the words, I just married Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Because that's, if I'm remembering this, it's not him, it was another story. That's mm-hmm. literally what he heard. She said what she said. That's what he heard. You mm-hmm. think, where in the world does that come from? Well, if you understand that the ones who have hated us, persecuted us, driven us out through the centuries have been Christians. Yeah. You understand that, that given the choice of baptism or death by the crusaders, baptism or death, that they recited the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It became a sacred tradition to die reciting the Shema, reciting loyalty to the God of Israel, rather than be baptized into this apostate faith and become an idol worshiper, that they chose death. And now your ancestors died rather than believe this. And now you freely are betraying your God and betraying your family and betraying your history yeah. to, to follow this false religion. That's the weight of it. That's, that's the force of it. And then the other question, who are you to argue with the rabbis? Now, you know, Christians can deal with this on a certain level. My pastor can't be wrong. You know, he went to seminary. He, he's a man of prayer. He studies mm-hmm. the word every day. He's a great teacher. He knows the Hebrew and the Greek. You have to multiply that in the Jewish community where there's even a greater emphasis on study and learning. You know, a, a Christian friend of mine told me that he took a class once at Yeshiva University as a Christian minister on the book of Isaiah. And when he came in for the class, of course, he had his English Bible with him, right? And he looked around and none of the other students in the class, this is his story. He's just telling me this, right? I can't verify it. Uh, but none of the other students in the class brought their Bibles. So he's like, where's your Hebrew Bible? Well, hmm. they memorized Isaiah in preparation for the class. Yeah. In Hebrew. So that's why they didn't bring their Bibles. So you're, you're talking about a level of learning, which is so very, very different. Your average 12 or 13-year-old Jewish kid has learned more material in terms of memorized, more religious material than your average person graduating seminary with a PhD. Mm. So, and the rabbi is the learned one. And, and then because it is communal, if our rabbis together all rejected this Jesus, then that's all you need to know. You don't know better than them. And the further back you go, the closer they are to the original revelation going back to Mount Sinai. In Judaism, every generation is further removed from Mount Sinai, therefore needs to rely more on the giants of the past. As the saying in the Talmud goes, if, if the former generation was angels, we're men. If the former generation was men, we're donkeys. So we sit on the shoulders of the of the leaders of, of the past. And in fact, I'm just going to do something here since we're yeah, talking. Yeah. I'm just going to, all right, okay, hang on. So I'm just getting the book from behind me. Sounds good. And um, this is part of what's called a rabbinic Bible. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is Chumash Mikro Kedolo, the five books of Moses, a big script. Mikro Kedolo literally means big scripture. So I'm mm-hmm. going to open it up for you, okay? Mm-hmm. And... This is, this is how a traditional Jew reads scripture. The scripture mm-hmm. verses are over here. That's in big print. Uh-huh. Next to it, Aramaic, Targum. But everything else here on each page, commentaries. So the bulk of each page is made up of commentaries. That's how a traditional Jew studies the Bible. You don't have to study it independently. You read it in light of the commentaries, because these were the great learned men of the previous generations that stood much closer to the revelation. And w- when I was uh, talking to a ultra Orthodox Jew in Brooklyn in my early years in the faith, he said, look, I learned it from my father who learned it from his father, who learned it from his father going all the way back to Moses. So you're telling me someone lied. You're telling me someone along the way lied and I should believe you now a Christian in a church, right? You know, so mm. that's, that's a lot of the perspective and that's, that's a lot of what has to be overcome. Mm. Wow. It's kind of like when, you know, we have the, and I hate to make this comparison, but we have like the Jehovah's witnesses and they ha- they're reading their Bible, but they're also reading you know, the new world translation. But on top of that, the watchtower track society, which is an additional commentary that tells right. them how to think about the Bible. So like, or awake as- magazine. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, so when we as Christians hear the story about Abraham and Isaac, we can see the beauty of the, the, the typology I'd probably using the wrong word about the sacrifice of Christ coming in the future says uh, that he will prov- provide the sacrifice. You know, we have Isaac walking up the same very same mountain where Christ is going to be sacrificed, carrying wood upon his back where Christ carried wood 
uh, you know, his, uh, his cross, it's like, we can see those beautiful things, but for some reason, it seems like there's that, uh, tradition in there that is blinding, uh, people from seeing a really beautiful way of Christ in the old Testament, because as Christians, we see that Jesus Christ is all throughout the old Testament. Even Jesus condemns the Pharisees. He says, if you really true, truly knew who Moses was, you would know me. Moses spoke about me. So how, how, how does that happen? How, how are these, um, these people growing up in these traditions, uh, coming to know Jesus as someone just presenting the gospel to them one day and God is working on their hearts and regenerating them. Like what's, what's, what's happening. It, it comes in several different ways. There are some here and there that as they're growing up, they begin to question the system. Why should I believe They just, it, it doesn't sit, you know, the they get the same answer as the kids sitting next to them in the class but it doesn't sit well with them. And they just, something doesn't seem to line up, which makes them begin to ask questions. And those questions ultimately lead far enough for them to, to reconsider even bigger issues. Like mm. who is this Jesus? Because the, the more religious you are, the less you know who he is. If you're ultra, ultra religious, then all you know of him is he was a sorcerer, an idol worshiper that led Israel astray, a false miracle worker. And he was rightly put to death by the, by the Sanhedrin. That's all you know about him. So you have no, no clue about that. And that his teaching leads straight to the Holocaust. That's basically what, what you know. That's why you can't say his name. You spit on the floor if, if you say his name or you, you say it in a derogatory way uh, because that's, that's what you know of him. Mm-hmm. So the, for some, they start a- asking questions. Others uh, reading scripture which is read, but it is, it is not essentially you're mainly reading the, you know, studying the, the, the traditions, the legal mm-hmm. traditions and the legal commentary and all of that. But here and there, it's just been reading scripture directly. Sometime it's by getting to know a Christian. And, uh, you know, I, I know one fellow when he was a teenager was in the hospital and all he knew about the Christians was stay away from them. They're bad. And sharing a room with a Christian kid and the mom, and they were just nice and gracious. And he, he saw something in them. Uh, for yeah. others, the religious, they leave tradition first. There's a small percentage that leave uh, leaves every year, mm. and they're called off the derech, off the off the path. And uh, sometimes they get away from things and then are more open to hear the rest of the story. And then here and there, it's sovereign. You know, oh. there's something. Is, you know, they see a track somewhere, you know, they stumble across a, a video, but the, the most Orthodox live in such a closed world that they don't have smartphones. They, they just have traditional flip phones and then they know certain area codes are kosher. If it's a call from outside of that, you don't take it. You know, you don't have a TV in your home. You don't use internet. Wow. So, you know, reaching into those communities, the ultra, ultra Orthodox is even more challenging. But it, it happens in numerous ways. You plant seeds, you get messages out, hmm. uh, you know, uh, you do a debate, people come, a seed gets planted in them. Wow. Well, it's just interesting. You, you, you think, because I'm thinking just the parallel, you're talking about certain people who within Judaism, they kind of question their traditions or what they've grown up with. So you probably, I'm, you've done discussions on In the Line of Fire about people who are deconstructing or ex-evangelicals oh, yeah, yeah. within Christianity, yeah. but also it almost sounds like there's that's happening many a times within Judaism, the different branches, but that's actually a catalyst for them to look at alternatives, and that's where you're a, a place like your ministry is effective for giving them answers to their questions then. Yeah, exactly. And for, for the religious Jew, the, the very, very religious Jew, it can be even more traumatic than say for ex-evangelical because they've lived in a certain community which is totally communal. You pray mm-hmm. together, you study together. You're you're in the synagogue studying late at night together. Yeah. You you are living your lives together. You have basic vocation for function, but your main goal is Torah study, by which I mean all of rabbinic literature and prayer. Uh, that's your that's your greatest goal. Mm. So now you come out of that, you don't have you're you're not used to normal social life. You may not know how to do certain jobs and things. So the, the, the normal saying is you either end up on drugs, dead or back in a community because they, they see, they're often aimless because of the depths to which they've, they've lived together in, in a communal setting and, and practice their faith in that way. But because the world is getting smaller, because it's, it's harder to, to be shut off, 
because people do get internet access and they are curious. So that's just opened the door. I'm sure you see it in all traditional religions mm -hmm. that, that people are getting exposed to things and falling away. I have a book coming out in March called Why So Many Christians Have Left the Faith, where I, I uh, look at deconstructionism and then talk about how we respond. But what's happened is a lot of stuff that we in apologetics have dealt with for decades mm -hmm. is now getting exposed in mass to the larger Christian world that hasn't been exposed. And suddenly they're getting hit with all this stuff that they've never been hit with before. Uh, and, and that's why we've really got to up what we're doing in apologetics to help more and more people. Yeah. We've been really uh, reactionary in a sense, uh, instead of proactive that, that brings us to this kind of question, like in terms of uh, counter missionaries uh, or objections against Jesus being the Messiah, we have some written down, but I'm actually curious, what do you think are like the four best of, uh, uh, let's say objections that come in? What are the, the biblical responses, the Christian response to mm -hmm. the objections that are, that are given by uh, Jewish people or Judaism? Uh, all right. So, so you want the, make sure I have, I, I have the right order here. Yeah. Do you want, the the strongest jewish objection and the best christian response absolutely well, just, yeah just some just a good plethora sampling of just some of the top objections that yeah, come yeah. up in okay. this whole so, conversation yeah so bear in mind what i'm going to do now is a mega condensation <laughs> of 1500 plus pages and thousands of hours of dialogue and debate and writing study okay yeah i'm going to break them into categories six right. categories mm -hmm. um general historical, theological, messianic prophecy, New Testament, traditional Jewish. Those are the six parts of the five volumes. Um, so and I may have left one out. I'll make sure I cover it now. General, those are the most basic. I'm born a Jew. I'm going to die a Jew, right? It just It's Jewish identity. This is who I am. And the simple thing is, yes, that's true. The question is, who is the Messiah? Uh -huh. And will you die a Jew in right relationship with God or what? That, that's the most simple. When you dig further, historical objections are of two kinds. One, as we said, if there's any religion on the planet that could not be God's religion, it's Christianity because of anti-Semitism. Uh, and two, when the Messiah comes, there'll be peace on earth. Look at the Messianic prophecies, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 2, other passages. When the, <laughs> excuse me. When the Messiah comes, there'll be peace on earth. And, mm -hmm. and he'll rule and reign. That hasn't happened Obviously, the Messiah never came. The answers to those are, number one, the New Testament reaffirms God's promises to Israel and the Jewish people. Jesus comes as Jewish Messiah. He's returning to Jerusalem. And Paul explicitly warned about Gentile arrogance that would think that the church replaced Israel. It's only to the extent that the Christians got away from the New Testament that they became anti-Semitic. And the reason that evangelical Jews are the best friends of Christians are, are because of their, their love for the word of God and taking the scriptures seriously. Hmm. And through history, there have been philo-Semites. There have, there have been Christians, be it a Charles Spurgeon, be it a Robert Murray McShane, be it the Puritans, be it others through history that love Jesus and love the Jewish people. And there a Gentile yeah. Christian says, hey, I, I apologize for what's been done in Jesus' name. Let me show you who a real Christian is. As far as the history issue of the Messiah obviously hasn't come, we have to make our argument scripturally that there are two aspects to the Messiah's work, first priestly, then royal. First, he comes as the priestly king to deal with sin, and, and then from there to be a light to the world, then he will return to establish his kingdom on the earth. So there are two acts, the first act and the second act. The second act can only take place after the first. The Messiah must first do this before coming to establish peace on earth. When it comes to theological objections, uh, those are more weighty still. Jews worship one God, not three. God is not a man. Making a man into a God or a God into a man is the worst form of idolatry. And uh, not only so, uh, Jews don't need blood for atonement, that if we're obedient to Torah and repent, that God will forgive our sins. And then there are many other smaller theological objections. So our answer is that we must emphasize strongly we believe in one God and one God only, but mm -hmm. that we see revealed in the Hebrew scriptures that this one God is complex in his unity, yeah. that he is seen and unseen, that he is transcendent and yet imminent, that, that no one can see his face 
and yet he reveals himself face to face. How do we explain it? We explain it in terms of his complex unity, that the father who creates all things is hidden in his glory. John 1, no one's seen God at any time. First Timothy 6, no one has seen God or can see him. So he dwells in unapproachable glory, but Yeshua says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's the Son who makes him known, and the Ruach, the Spirit, who works invisibly on earth. And we can show all that from the Hebrew Bible. And we are not making a man into a God or God into a man. We're saying that the eternal almighty God who, who sits enthroned in heaven can simultaneously reveal himself on earth. That points to what we would refer to as the, the different persons of the Godhead. And again, would argue that based on Hebrew Bible. When it comes to atonement, we would agree in emphasizing the importance of, of, um, blood, uh, of, of repentance, but go through the scriptures to indicate the centrality of blood atonement. And with the temple destroyed, there's either no national atonement or God's provided a better way. Uh, messianic prophecy, the main objections are that the Messiah, that Jesus fulfilled none of the provable messianic prophecies, that the New Testament authors either misinterpreted or misquoted or even event, invented prophecies out of whole cloth. Yeah. Again, a massive subject. Our answer is, uh, although we can't prove he was born of a virgin, we, we can't prove that he rose from the dead or we can make a strong argument for it. We can't prove he was born in Bethlehem. We, we can prove that this tiny little sect based on, on a man who was crucified and died the worst deaths imaginable of the day, that has, he has become a light to the nations, that hundreds of millions of Gentiles have come to worship the God of Israel through him, which is pretty provable messianic prophecy among others. And then we look at the prophecies and we understand how they are messianic. Many times Christians read in a very atomistic way to just pull a verse out. Don't look at the context. Don't look at the background. Don't look at Jewish interpretive methods of the first century. So we go, we, we have to go through each one. Why does Matthew 1, uh, uh, 23 quote Isaiah 7, 14? Why, yeah. you know, and, and, and one by one go through them and show the validity of yeah. them. Some are typological, some are, mm -hmm. are primary. Um, and, and then New Testament objections would, would be specific Jewish ones that the New Testament authors regularly mishandle the Old Testament and that uh, they the New Testament teaches that Jesus abolishes the law. And a Jew, the one thing a Jew knows is that they are called to observe the Torah. And what we, we, we point out, and then of course, arguments with genealogies and Jesus can't be the Messiah based on that. But what we do is we show the interpretive methods of New Testament authors. We show the different textual traditions that mm -hmm. existed in the day that they could be drawn from. Uh, we show how the Jewish followers of Jesus continued to live as Jews, understanding they weren't justified by the works of the law but mm -hmm. that as Jews, they continue to live as Jews, that Paul said, if you're circumcised, when you're saved, don't become uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. So we, we rebut that and that Yeshua came to, to fulfill, not abolish. And then traditional Jewish objections, uh, that basically says we have an unbroken chain of tradition going back to Moses on Mount Sinai, that when God gave Moses the written law, he also gave him an oral law. And only with the oral law can we rightly understand the written. And we've had an unbroken chain of tradition for now uh, 3,500 years. And what we argue is that the covenant was based on the written word, the written word alone, and as beautiful as many of the traditions are, that ultimately the, oral, the idea of an unbroken oral tradition going back to Moses is a myth. And, and we refute that with respect. And of course, the idea of Judaism saying, hey, look, we made it this far. We made it through all the horrors of our history. We made it scattered around the world. We made it through the Holocaust. We're still here. We have a fine relationship with God. We don't need your Jesus. Yeah. Uh, we would say with all respect, we've been under judgment through much of that time. Something has been wrong. The temple is still not rebuilt. Could it be that in the midst of God preserving us, there's something very important that we've missed? And what about you? What about your own relationship with God? And mm. press the gospel like we would with anyone else. Wow. So that's, that's a super short summary <laughs> like that, a thousand more yeah. questions which we're not time for but right. maybe another time digging yeah. deeper on those no that's a great super short summary uh, could you just tell anyone who wants to look into this further uh you mentioned the website earlier where can people go to to find out more about this of what yeah, we're the talking easiest about? place to get tons of free material is realmessiah.com okay they can they can buy the any of the books answering jewish objections to jesus uh, those are all available. The course, Countering the Counter Missionaries, 22 Hours with a Study Guide. 
But right there, they will get these six categories and a hundred or so of the most common objections with either a written uh, or a video or both explanation, answer, right? Mm -hmm. So everything I just covered in, in depth, or they can watch quite a few debates I've had with rabbis there for free. Uh, they can watch uh, outreach videos. Uh, they can watch uh, the Refuting the Counter Missionary. So all there for free on realmessiah.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And again, I think I want to appreciate you so much, Dr. Brown, for taking the time uh, to chat with us today. I know this is going to be a huge blessing for our audience. I do have one last question. Andrew and I were actually wondering this too. So you have decades of ministry uh, focused here, and this is your background, that you had an amazing encounter with God, and you've spent all this time ministering to the Jewish people. Do you have a story that you've never shared with anyone that you could maybe just share with their audience? Just, it can be anything. Just something that's unique, an encounter with something, with someone, a conversation that took place, perhaps maybe there's some interesting humor, just something that we'd appreciate, maybe just uh, connected to what we've been talking about as we wrap up here. All right. I, I mean, I, I, I'd have to dig to figure out one that I've never shared. Or just, just, or, just or one off the get-go. But, but I'll tell you I haven't yeah. shared in, in a while. Okay. So Fair enough. I was, I was going to grad school, living on Long Island, uh -huh. uh, right near a, a traditional Jewish community. I wasn't over there much, but th there, there was a, a very religious community that, that lived not far from me. And I was doing my, my studies at, at New York University, so I was doing, doing my master's and PhD. I forget at which point of time that was. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, about to get on a train to go into New York City, uh, finish my work for the day, and now was, my job now was going in for my, for my class late afternoon, early evening. And I see an Orthodox Jew there. So immediately I want to go talk to him. So yeah. I go over to him and he says, Shalom Aleichem, the traditional way of greeting. You're supposed to say Aleichem Shalom. You know, that's, that's how you greet back. And anyway, we begin talking. And when he finds out I'm a Jewish believer, he is absolutely furious. Again, I know how he sees me. I understand I'm not in his shoes, but I understand how I look to him, how mm -hmm. guilty I am to him. So we're talking. I've got my Hebrew Bible with me. And. And he is so upset. And we're on a train on Long Island Railroad, the two of us talking, and he's very passionate. And at one point, he takes the Hebrew Bible and throws it. Now, that, that was a sacrilegious thing for him to do, but he was so upset with the way I was using it. And the conductor is you know, walking through the train to get train tickets. I, Could you please hand me that Bible that this man threw, gives it to me? Well, we're talking. And at one point, he spits in my face. And the moment he did that, I got overwhelmed with a sense of love for him. Mm. And I said, you did that because you love me as a Jew, because you are so upset seeing me as a Jew. And now as an you know, increasingly learned Jew, mm. not a traditional Jew, right? I've never tried to make that my background or present myself as that, but I, I'm learning more and more. I can interact with the sources more and more. So all the more guilty, dangerous in a sight. So I said to him, I said, you really care about me? I, I said, I want you to know I love you too. But of course, got him angrier. So finally, right at the end, he looked at me before he got off the train. He said, if I ever see you talking to another Jewish person about this, I'm going to strangle you with my own hands. And he got mm -hmm. off the train. And what, what struck me, though, was he really cared for me. He was that upset that here I am, a young Jewish man, and I've not just gone so far astray in his eyes, but I'm, I'm, I'm actively proselytizing. What could be worse than that? And he spat in my face out of love. Obviously, wow. there was anger, and obviously, uh, he was seeking to provoke me because it was a calculated thing. But I knew what was behind it. I knew why he was so upset. And, and I respect that. It only gives me a greater love for my people, remember Romans 10, mm -hmm. Paul said of his people have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And, and, you know, your average Christian who gets exposed to an ultra-Orthodox Jewish family or sees the lifestyle of an ultra-Orthodox Jew, once they get past the foreignness of things and the foreignness of the traditions, they will be put to shame hmm. in terms of devotion. They will be, you know, your average ultra-Orthodox Jew would look at the home of a Christian and say, you are so worldly. 
You have mm-hmm. TVs, you watch these movies, you're into sports and all these secular stars. We're, we follow God and Torah. That's our center. That's our mm-hmm. life. That's our compass. Yeah. So it's all the more heartbreaking to me when, when, I, when I'm in Israel and go to, go to the wall to, to pray uh, on a trip. Uh, I, I always try to pray side by side with traditional Jews just to kind of feel the passion, feel the hunger, feel, from my perspective, the lostness mm-hmm. and intercede that God would open their eyes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Brown. Uh, We appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, talk to you all soon uh, on Cultish. And thank you all for listening in. And we'll talk to you all next time on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you guys soon.